Built for their livelihood and used also as a place of worship, this splendid hop kiln, so reminiscent of those in the south of England, is in fact some 12,000 miles away in Australia's only island state, Tasmania. Described as the most English of all Australian states, Tasmania was colonised by the British as a penal colony, and since those days of early settlement, hops used in the bittering of beer have been grown. Constructed in the last century, this property was once an inn. The heavy locks and bolts were used to keep bushrangers and escaped convicts out, rather than the patrons in. The stained glass and those elegant, cool verandas hinted less anxious times for those early farmers. Now, their machinery returns to the soil and a new breed of farmer adapting to the 70s emerges. The early pioneers are not forgotten and some of their fine functional architecture is finding new uses. Today, tourists come to drink their tea and pay homage to the tenacity of those pioneers. These exhibits and photographs look back to an age when hop picking was a family affair, untouched by mechanisation. An age when hop gardens were hand picked by an army of pickers. Sometimes more than 300 strong, the pickers would move from garden to garden, town to town. Australia, with a population of approximately 13 million, consumes 128 litres per head annually and two-thirds of the hops used for this vast quantity of beer are grown here in this beautiful island. Here in the capital Hobart, the first brewery in Australia was established and at no time in a long and notable history have any artificial chemicals been used in its brew. Bales of natural hops await the brewer's art, an art indeed, for hops not only give flavour to the brew, but assist in its stability and clarity during storage. quantity and blend of hops usually remains the brewer's secret, but the cultivation of Tasmanian hops is perhaps no lesser craft. Here hops are grown under a minimum cultivation system. The earth is rarely touched by mechanical implement. This is probably cheaper, but more importantly, by not cultivating the soil, a network of very fine feeder roots just under the surface isn't continually disturbed. The hop is a perennial plant and not planted every year and after the first fertiliser dressing an operation called stringing takes place. It is up this polypropylene string that the hop plant will grow to a height of five and a half metres there are two vines to a string and three strings to a hill, which is the name given to the plant itself. The hop stems, called vines, are trained up the string and the excess is removed. It is after this training that the nitrogen supply becomes very important to the plant.
Tasmania has a longer ratio of daylight hours compared with the rest of Australia. And with its temperate marine climate, it is perhaps the optimum place for hop growing. Very strict quarantine regulations ensure that the Australian hop industry is favoured by the absence of plant diseases, so very prevalent in the northern hemisphere. With the ever-increasing stringency in world health regulations, particularly with residues of fungicides, it's gratifying to find hop gardens where they are neither used or needed. Tasmanian hop growers can produce hops guaranteed to be completely free of fungicidal residues. From a horticultural point of view, the crop needs a lot of individual attention and neglect will have the obvious result of a low yield. The height of the framework is five and a half metres and is supporting probably 20 to 30 tonnes of green matter per acre, making water requirements substantial. The latitude in Australia is quite different from England. Consequently, the varieties that were introduced by the early British settlers tended to be rather poor. It was decided to establish a hop breeding station specifically for the production of varieties bred and suitable to the Australian latitude. As you can see, the success in this is really remarkable. These are Pride of Ringwood hops, which now account for virtually the whole of Australian production. This variety has brewing value at least twice the average of the traditional varieties and is also a much heavier yielding hop per acre. Hops are grown for the resin they contain, the resin being visible as very small, round, bright yellow globules. These globules are glands that excrete the resins, which consist of bittering substances, the major one of which is called alpha acid. In Australia, the term hop quality is almost synonymous with the percentage of acid, and with this so important to brewers, it is being checked continually. These analyses are done on green, hand-picked samples of hops in which the alpha acid content as well as the moisture content are determined. Many export clients are looking for characteristics other than the bittering capacity. And essential oils, their quantity and relative composition, play an important part in fixing preferences for one type of hop or another. Atomic absorption spectrophotometry, together with other procedures, is leading to a very good understanding of fertiliser requirements. Laboratory analysis now even determines the start of harvest. The Australian hop industry is established on high volume, low cost production units. This 50-acre block you're looking at would once have needed 450 people to pick it by hand. Now, the labour content would be no more than 20. These incredibly high labour-saving devices remove all but the hop cone in a matter of minutes. All picking machines of whatever make consist of essentially two parts, a picking and a cleaning section.
drums, which carry wire fingers, rip off the hop cones and leaves. And in the second part, the leaves are separated from the cones. The leaves going outside the shed as trash. After final inspection, the hop cones are conveyed to a kiln to be dried and conditioned. Depending on the stage of ripeness, the moisture content of the green cones is about 75 to 78 percent at picking, and the aim of drying is to reduce this to a final moisture content of 8 or 10 percent. During drying, a series of mesh louvers set in storied banks drop the cones from floor to floor. Each floor is of comparatively shallow depth, obviating a moisture gradient within the floor. Since the hops are stirred when dropped, the product is rendered more homogeneous. Working at temperatures of 65 degrees Celsius, forced draft, open flame, oil-fired kilns are universal. Drying cycles of five to six hours are being achieved with air speeds of 80 feet a minute. At the end of the drying period, the residual moisture of the cone is contained in the central axis of the structure and a conditioning period follows, which allows the moisture to equalise throughout the entire hop cone. The dried hops can then be handled in two different ways. For brewers who prefer hops in their natural state, they are pressed into polypropylene bales. Each bale holds 113 kilograms, and for export shipping has a volume of 0.4 of a cubic metre. Enormous savings in shipping costs can be obtained by grinding the dried hops in a hammer mill and recompressing the powder into pellets. After going through a cooling tower, the pellets are weighed, the air present evacuated, and the bag flushed with nitrogen gas prior to heat sealing. Stored in this nitrogen atmosphere, there is no oxidisation and no deterioration. The need for refrigerated containers during shipping is eliminated and the export customer provided with a more uniform product. The much higher density of pellets reduces shipping space by two-thirds. These cartons are used to fulfil an export order and consequently stacked and given additional protective wrapping before being placed into a shipping container. The Australian hop industry is already established in high volume, low cost operations that fully utilise the high yielding, high alpha variety, Pride of Ringwood. Harvesting and kilning units of sufficient size to enable in-line pelletising immediately off the kiln are available stabilising alpha acid within a maximum of 12 hours of harvest. A harvest six months out of phase with the northern hemisphere provides potential customers with the opportunity of maintaining a supply of fresh hops throughout the year, an advantage that the early colonial farmers would, I'm sure, have been proud. <laughs>